Thank you guys so much for your patience. Uh, I guess I'll defer to Diana if we're ready to get yes, started. Am I like, can, should I stand here? Either place works. Okay, if I stand here, the light won't be in my eyes. Okay, yeah. So, I've got okay. it zoomed in on you and the, the thing, so you're good. Okay. Um, well, thank you guys so much for your patience. Um, this has been a long time in the making, so we'll have some fun and learn about data strategy over the next. Um, I guess I can maybe go faster than um, an hour ago. Wait, we'll try to wrap it up in 45 minutes, so we'll end on time. Um, okay, so it's really good to be in a room, even if the tech setup took a while. Um, it's good to have like audience feedback. I'm really used to giving this talk over Zoom. Um, and I like to kick it off with uh, one of my favorite jokes, which is, what is a data strategy presenter's least favorite drink. Booze. <laughs> um, which hopefully, well, so hopefully you guys won't give me any of those this evening, but if you don't enjoy this presentation, maybe you can share it with somebody who you don't like, um, maybe your boss, <laughs> maybe the, uh, the shy IT guy at your company or that like backend engineer who has bad eye contact. Um, so yeah, okay, so welcome to the data strategy talk. Um, if you want to follow along, um, I won't be mad at all if you pull out your phone and your laptop and you go to um, this bit.ly URL, um, which will bring you to this page here. Um, so at this page, you'll find all the slides that I'll share with you today and also spaced repetition questions. Uh, so what that means is you can kind of challenge yourself uh, to see if you're following along with the material and you're remembering what you're hearing. And um, the app, it's called Orbit, it's embedded into the page and you can actually like sign up with your email and it'll just send you these same questions um, at a spaced repetition schedule, which is the, you know, the best scientifically proven way to lock in content into your long-term memory. So if you are interested in data strategy, I encourage you to check out that page and use the Space Repetition app. Um, if you want, to, you want to really learn and understand this. Um, okay, cool. Um, so here's a little bit of info about me. Um, in the interest of keeping this short and sticking to my goal of not boring you guys to death. Um, we won't spend long on this slide. Um, I used to work as a data scientist. Uh, I got CD and key certified, so that's this, um, in October of 2020. I now work as a full stack engineer at Coinbase. However, I am still qualified to teach you about data stuff because data scientists never die. They just get broken down by age. <laughs> okay, another little statistics joke for you. Um, yeah, and then this photo, um, photo credits to Diana. So thank you so much for being my photographer. You're welcome. Um, in addition to being at Coinbase, I'm also the community organizer for data strategy professionals. So we have t-shirts in gray, two colors of gray, and we also do data strategy and data science. Um, yeah. Okay. So now let's dive into the content. Okay. So primary objective of the talk, not to bore you guys. Secondary objective is to help you better understand the whys and the hows of implementing better data management practices at your organization. So, um, so I use data science as an example, but I think this is true of every branch of data practitioners. Um, so we data scientists, we think we're the rainbow, but really data science is only a small portion of the whole data strategy spectrum, just like the visible light spectrum is only a small portion of the total available wavelengths. So just for data science, you have like, you know, the like data ops team might be the, like um, data engineers who are responsible for generating vertical data sets. And then the dev sec ops people might be responsible for deploying models. But there's, you know, 
the spectrum extends out in either direction for quite a ways. Data strategy is a broad field. And so we're going to talk a bit about that tonight. Um, okay, so another representation, a nonlinear representation, if you will, of data management is uh, what's called the Aiken data framework. And so what you see here is sort of like a Maslow's hierarchy of needs type thing, where you, um, the organization needs to have a strong basis in the elements listed here before they can really move up towards the top of the pyramid. Um, sometimes you'll see organizations, they wanna jump straight into like the data reporting um, and like data science, uh, statistics machine learning without first having a solid foundation. And that's a mistake. Um, just like we know from playing Jenga, uh, towers don't do very well with pieces missing um, from the base. So it's really important to develop a strong, like everything starts with data governance. So that's gonna be the first thing we talk about. Uh, okay, so in case you need more motivation um, to learn and understand this topic, in the year 2020, the size of our digital universe was 40 trillion gigabytes, which represents a 30X expansion in just one decade. Um, so, that's pretty extensive, and I think that, um, you know, I'm reticent to use the, the M word that starts with meta and ends with verse, but just with the increasing hype around these, like, AR and VR and mixed reality experiences, so much of our lives are, you know, going to be moving online in this current decade, that I think that 30x expansion could, like, continue to uh, increment. Um, and so just more data, more online experiences lends itself to the creation of more data, which of course creates more opportunities and risks for data practitioners. So this is a, a really important field. Um, this quote, this stat comes from uh, Tech Jury. Okay. I love this comic. I discovered this yesterday and I thought it was so perfect for this presentation. Um, so this is at KCD and it really summarizes the problem um, or the opportunity uh, of our profession, which is like, you know, the more data you have, the more data you can work with to like generate insights and then that creates more data. Um, so one of the terms that you'll hear me use in this presentation, or at least that we'll get to in a second, but it's like metadata, which is, you know, categorizing your data. And then when you make data science models, like that also generates insights. And then like you need to work with those as like a data product, basically. So anyway, this creates the data trap slash data opportunity. The point is data strategy is important now and it's going to be increasingly important in the future. All right. So in the book, The Lean Startup, Eric Ries explores how innovation leaders can use data to support experimentation. So the book applies not just to startups, but also to enterprises across the maturity spectrum. Um, really, a strong data framework allows organizations to validate hypotheses about their business, and the data provides a common language across business functions that allows the organization to like do testing about those hypotheses and then move forward towards an empirically derived truth around what their customers value. Yeah, so all businesses should be working towards this objective leveraging data as a strategic asset. Um, on the other hand, the very existence of an organization can be threatened by poor data quality. So says Joe Capard. He is a principal research scientist at MIT. Um, data strategy helps an organization to mitigate their risks around data, which protects not just their, like the existence of their company, also their customers and the, you know, the integrity of their suppliers and their employees. Okay, so now I'm gonna pause. Um, this 
question slide is to remind me to uh, check in with you guys and see if anything I've said so far kind of like drawing loose a question. Is there a way for the Oklahoma City folks to ask questions if they need to? We will come back to this if anyone find those for questions too. We don't have any questions. Okay, cool. Well, just let me know if that changes. All right, great. So we've made it this far. Um, let's dive into the topics of data strategy. So you'll see there are four main listed here. Um, we won't have time to talk about all of them. So we're just going to look at five um, data governance, data quality, architecture, and modeling. Together, um, data warehousing and business intelligence, and master and reference data. Um, cool. So, yeah, obviously, all of these are important, but I just thought I'd kind of pick some from the base and some from kind of top of the pyramid, and we'll cover those in the remaining 30 minutes. Starting, oh, uh, so I also like to do a little informal survey. So, for those of you who are here, you can just kind of shout it out. Um, which of these do you think is the most important for us to learn about? Okay. Data quality. Data quality. Yeah. I mean, there is no like right answer, but I kind of think it's interesting to ask and then also to see if people kind of change their mind um, as they hear more. Um, yeah, they're all important. But we'll talk more about this at the end. All right. Kicking things off, talking about data, data governance. So this refers to the practices and the processes to ensure the formal management of data assets. Um, if you don't have good data governance, your other improvements to the data pipeline will unravel over time. Okay, um, here are the recommended processes and organizational structures to support data governance. Um, again, the slides are online, so or up here, so you don't have to worry about notes or like remembering all of this, but I'll run through some of them. Um, so in terms of the processes, the primary objective is to connect data to strategic objectives. Um, then you'll want to create a data charter. So this is the document that all stakeholders agree to, and it formalizes like it's a formal agreement of uh, what is to be done with the organization's data. Um, yeah, and that charter will contain a clear vision of the future state. So you, you want to do these other things too. All right. And in terms of your, your organization, um, these are some positions that are related to the data governance effort. So it's really important to formalize this because you want the data governance to be a process, not a project. So what I mean by that is, you know, you may have like, I don't know, one guy working in a business unit and you're like, oh, he knows all the stuff and that's great. But if that guy leaves, then you lose the institutional knowledge. So that's why you want to formalize his role as a data steward and then replace him with a new data steward when you know he moves on from the organization. So you know you can't you shouldn't rely on kind of informal like a data cabal. It should you should have like a formal uh like a data formalized data council. Um okay. Um Great, so yeah, in terms of getting started with data governance, um, you should first align the data related benefits and risks to whatever the organization's mission statement is. Then you should set up an organizational structure that will solidify data governance for the long term and then uh, conduct a data maturity assessment that, like, it's a gap assessment, essentially. Like, how far do we have to go to reach our future vision? Um, when you're doing that maturity assessment, you can let it be guided by the following questions. Is data freely shared across business units? 
Do data consumers have the skills and endpoints required to access the data they need in their day-to-day -day work? And is data quality trusted? So data quality, key for morale. We'll be talking about that next. Um, just very quickly, um, when you're crafting a data governance policy, like in your charter, you want to include these elements. Um, Let's see, um, if you look at this one, the roles and responsibilities, the racing matrix um, is really important. So that will identify which stakeholders are responsible, which stakeholders are accountable, which stakeholders are consulted, and which ones are informed for each specific aspect of your initiative. So it's, it's, a, it's a matrix, like a table that contains that information. And that's a really key element of uh, moving this initiative forward in a big organization. Um, okay, and then here is a sample data governance policy. So um, this is from the public sector. Um, it's like that's easier to find than a private sector policy. Um, it's actually from the Department of Defense. And I really like that they are super clear about how, like, we like to use the term data as an asset, but they say data as a weapon system. They make it super direct to their mission statement, which is like a key um, criteria of success uh, in defining the data governance charter. Um, it also talks about specific um, stakeholders, so the users of the data um, being joint all domain operations, senior leader decision support, and business analytics. So it clearly identifies the outcomes of a good, like what the future state data governance will look like in terms of improving the quality of data in these areas. Okay, um, and a couple of quotes from this uh, data management body of knowledge book. Uh, data stewards are not found, are found, not made, so we source them from the business units. Um, and yeah, like I said, it should be an ongoing process. So data governance requires a lot of time and energy, but it's foundational to setting up good organizational infrastructure. All right, so we've covered data governance, um, which is the foundation of the Aiken pyramid. It's the key to unlocking all the potential of data in your organization. Okay, now we're going to move on to a discussion of data quality. So according to the data management body of knowledge, data should be fit for a purpose. It should meet the requirements of its authors, users, and administrators. Um, they also lay out nine dimensions of data quality. So it's kind of one of those things that you know when you see it, like what is good data quality versus bad. But if you are attempting to come up with a schema for what constitutes good data, um, they propose these nine attributes. So in order to move forward with a data quality initiative, you should set up a a uh, formal data quality reporting process first. So back to the Lean Startup, which is one of my favorite business books. Eric Reese talks about the importance of asking why. So uh, you may have heard of the, like, the five whys. Um, I think that originated at Toyota, along with Lean Manufacturing. And that exercise is relevant to investigating the core issue at the heart of uh, a data quality problem so that you can conduct root cause remediation. So this could be as simple as like, you know, your company on the internet has a Google form where people can just click a button and say, hey, like I encountered some data, doesn't look right to me, like somebody check it out. And then you have like the data quality response team that would respond to that person and say, hey, we're looking into it. They would go and they would try to do root cause remediation using five whys, and then they would, hopefully identify the cause of the problem, fix it downstream and report back to the original user and say like, hey, thank you. Here was the problem. Here was the process we used to find it. And hopefully that 
solves the issue in the future because data quality, like I said, like it has a huge impact on morale. Um, this was definitely something that I experienced as a consultant. Um, yeah. Don't want to name names or shame <laughs> organizations, but um, once data becomes like not trusted, it's really hard to get anything done. Um, okay, so uh, another thing that's helpful is establishing a standard level of data literacy across the organization. So you can do this with like lunch and learns um, or like access to online learning content. Just getting everybody on board with the idea of like data is an asset, so you should recognize quality issues and report them uh, when you see them. And then I mentioned metadata. So this is data about data. So it's often like categories or like data lineage, which explains where the data came from. Um, and uh, the quality of metadata is a really important aspect of overall data quality. So yeah. Um, the, like a data catalog is a tool that can be used to improve the quality of metadata and democratize access to, um, to data sets um, where people are kind of empowered to like find all of the organizational data, um, like a, an index of it at least in one place. All right, so like data governance, data quality is an essential foundational element of overall data strategy. All right, so we've covered two and we've got three more to go. So any questions so far? Yes, Sam and Ben. So uh, there was a recent talk that Blue did on privacy. One of the, one of the points he put pressed on that is like to respect privacy, but to keep as little data as possible. Mm -hmm. But obviously, that's that's you know, because it's not a lot of visibility. Yeah. So, what do you think are good companies or resources to learn on how to balance data management with privacy? That is a really excellent question. Resources. So, there is a set of exams. So just like there's an exam on data management, there is an exam on data privacy. Um, there's like a family of exams. Um, and I think that's because like Europe has much stricter standards on data privacy than we do. The US has a lot of data privacy problems. Um, and like, like everything, it differs, the treatment of data privacy laws differs state to state. Um, California is like really leading the charge on data privacy here. Um, so anyway, so what that means for like the standard data practitioner in the US, I mean, I think it's just to be aware of climate, um, but I don't know. I guess I, my inclination is kind of to push back against like that. If you're storing the data responsibly, like and securely, then you should be able to collect it without fear. But at the same time, I can see a case for like, if you don't have any data, then there's no risk of, like if you don't have private data, then there's no risk of a data breach. So I think every organization needs to balance that trade-off um, and like make sure that they consult with their lawyers, which I am not. So where would you start if a company can give you the best possible privacy. So I guess it's so it's like twofold. It's one working with the data data app designers to design a collection process that is fit. Like data should be fit for a purpose. So making sure that the data collection process is clearly scoped to the needs of the app. And having really strong data security would be the second component of that strategy. I'm sure there are other things too, like having like 
data, overall data literacy and making sure that everybody in the company is aligned um, on, on strat like what is data security, um, like preventing phishing and things like that to eliminate the risk of breach. Does that, does that help? So like maybe a three-tiered approach is like designing a good data collection or like a very clearly scoped data collection process, having really good data security and having like strong data literacy slash awareness of security. Is that something people can go learn more about that on like Cybrary or like learning or anything from there? Do you want to say that louder? Oh, do you know if uh, you could go someplace like Cybrary or LinkedIn Learning to learn more about how to do those? Yes. Okay. Thank you for sharing those resources. <laughs> Cybrary? Yes. I'm not familiar with that, but it sounds, it's got a cool pun in the name. Yeah, I used to take classes. I had a cybersecurity job for a while, and that yes. was one of the resources we used. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So definitely, I will be going there. Leave, check that out <laughs> and then LinkedIn learning or just you know yeah those are two very solid recommendations Diana another question yes it's oh, one more question I'll let stop talking about somebody else's question so you've gone over how to manage your data we need to hurt the resources on making decisions because that's a really critical thing for companies like Netflix it's a competitive advantage yeah, it is. Netflix is really market leading in terms of how they approach their, their data and their overall um, infrastructure uh, for like data, data pipelines too. So um, let's revisit that question because we're going to be proceeding kind of like up the pyramid. And then when we talk about data warehousing and business intelligence, that would be more of a natural segue. So yes, thank you for that question. Any other questions? What else do you guys want to hear about? Yeah. Cool. All right, so next up, data architecture and modeling. So I just want to disambiguate. This is not like statistical modeling. This is data modeling. So you'll, I'll show you visually what that looks like. But when I present this to data scientists, I get questions like, wait, I thought we are the ones, we're the models. But the data science models are statistical models and they're not the same. All right. Um, cool. So this, these two areas, they're kind of like they they flow into one another. Um, so we'll group them together. They represent the transformation of business needs into technical specifications. So you start with data architecture, and that describes the existing state of the organization, defines data requirements, guides data integration, and controls data assets. And then you move into modeling. Um, so there are three clear stages that every modeling initiative will move through. So uh, the creation of conceptual, logical, and physical models. So we'll talk more about what that means. And then like as you're going through these stages, there's different ways that you can represent your the data. So like data needs to be aggregated and abstracted for people to be able to work with it and understand it. And that's why there's different, different ways of doing that to help facilitate different processes. Um, okay, so um, when you're doing data architecture, you'll start with an enterprise data model. And that will provide a consistent view of data across the organization. And then another tool that you can use is called a data flow diagram. And this is like across business units. It shows you how data is stored and how it's processed. Um, well, it's OK, so it's actually across databases, applications, platforms, and networks. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at what those terms actually translate to. So this flashback to the 90s um, is an enterprise data model for the airline industry. Um, so yes, so the, so the EDM, that's what you'll also hear this referred to as. Um, there's a lot of like alphabet soup as you get started with this, like a lot of acronyms. 
an EAM is a holistic enterprise level implementation independent conceptual or logical data model. It provides a common consistent view of data across the entire organization. So you're trying to represent everything that the organization does on one page. Um, like you have to really get abstracted to a very high level to do that, but that's the purpose of this tool, this diagram. Okay, then this is the data flow diagram that I was talking about. Um, and like here you have your, your, um, your processes at the top. So these are like, it could also be considered like different business units, like product, sales, order management, or fulfillment, manufacturing, and pricing. And then your different like, entities, which are, you know, the product, product part, manufacturing plant, customer sales order. And then the dark blue dots indicate where the data is created. And then the light blue dots are where the data is read or updated. So you can kind of imagine like this, but with an additional layer on top of like annotations, maybe describing the dots like, um, like, oh, this is like a Postgres database and it is talking to, you know, it's like sending the messages to a Tableau dashboard that the marketing team is using in their Monday meetings or, you know, you could like annotate it and have a higher level of detail here. Um, okay, so moving into data modeling. Um, so this is like after you've kind of done your initial data architecture steps, then moving that information into like the actual systems. Um, so the first step is to select the scheme or schemes that you want to use to represent the data and then the notation that goes with it. Then you like gather all of the entities and relationships. So in the airline example, the entities were like airport, parking lot, like schedules. And then the relationships are like how those elements are related to each other. Um, and then third, you wanna utilize organization specific terminology throughout the process. So it's no good if you're just like, you know, using generic terminology, like to go back to the DOD example, like they were, it's very explicit in their data governance document, like we're using this data to like enhance the US capability for warfare. Um, so you kind of want to take that mentality with every data document that your organization produces. Like it, it should be specific to your organization and you should use language that ties into your organization's mission statement. All right, so this is what a conceptual data model looks like. So this is the first of the three layers of the data modeling process. Um, in the conceptual data model, uh, you will find the things in the business and the relationships between them. Um, it's easy for an organization to want to skip this step um, and just proceed straight into like, oh, well, we have databases set up already, we'll, we'll just talk about them instead of like going to this very conceptual level. And that is a huge mistake because it means that the business units aren't aligning on their terminology. They're not having like tough conversations about which business unit owns which entities um, and then how to like distill them down in this way. So the conceptual data model is, it's a phase for a reason, it's not too skipped. Um, the logical data model is when you are kind of like building out the conceptual model where you're adding attributes and relationships. So instead of just having customers, now we have like their latitude and longitude, their name, other customer information, for example. Um, and then you can proceed to the physical data model, which is defining like how you actually would incorporate this information into a database. So like what, which of the attributes will be the primary key, which is like the unique identifier in a table, which ones will be foreign keys, which allow for communication across tables. 
Um, we also see, we saw this on the logical model too, where it's identifying data type. Um, but that's really important here because you're also like talk like this is should be implementation specific. So like at this stage, you should know like what technology, what flavor of SQL, for example, you're going to be using if you are going with a relational data store as your database of choice. Um, yeah, so just to recap here, sorry, I think I went a little too fast. Um, this is the first stage, conceptual. Then you build it out a little more, you have logical. You, this is like adding lists to the entities that we looked at in the conceptual stage. And then physical is when you really know what you're putting in a database, like the technical storage details. Um, okay. This is an example of the dimensional modeling schema, which is typically how data warehouses are laid out these days. So this is called the star schema because it's kind of shaped like a star. Um, and the center here is your fact table. <coughs> um, fact is a numerical value um, and then the associated foreign keys. And the foreign keys they link to these dimensional tables. Dimensional tables are descriptive attributes and they provide context to the fact table. Like I said, makes a star. Um, they don't have to be normalized. Um, this means that like, if it's more efficient for like the final purpose of analysis, it's okay to include redundancy in your, your data structures. Um, so that is a that is a component of dimensional modeling. That's not the only way to lay out your data. So like sometimes you might implement a normalized data storage system. Um, but for ease and efficiency, it's okay sometimes to have redundancy. Um, that is dimensional modeling. Okay, um, sorry I had to go through that a little bit quickly. Uh, if you want to learn more, there's a really good book called The Agile, it's called Agile Data Warehouse Design. It's by Lawrence Core and Jim Stagipino. Um, and yeah, they also have a website called modelstorming.com where there's lots of templates and things like that. Um, and they'll really like walk you through kind of like the lean process for data warehouse design. Um, and like I said, like the dimensional modeling uh, really lends itself well to a data warehouse. Uh, it's optimized for efficiency of analytics, which is what we're going to talk about next after the questions, or maybe now, if I think you're recording question, but this is, uh, it's called Agile Data Warehouse Design. By Lawrence Core. He's the primary author. We've got seven minutes. So I know I was gonna say. Do you guys want to go over just a little bit longer or okay? Okay. Um, yeah, so okay, so now the question is like what data or how how should decisions be made based on data? Is that your question, Sam? Oh, yeah, yeah, how do you make decisions based on data by metrics? Yeah, um, that's a great, great question. Um, so, yeah, so if you guys don't know what, De what Netflix has done really well is they, they build out like the, they're very advanced in their data pipeline. Um, which means that they're collecting a lot of data um, up front about your behavior on the site. And then they're constantly deploying like um, kind of like artificial intelligence, machine learning based uh, like um, so, so, if, it, so if you go to Netflix and you watch Star Trek, yeah. they start showing you more sci-fi. 
Yeah, they have, um, they use a, like a recommendation engine that's really advanced and it's based in machine learning. And it's kind of like, like the people like you like this feature. So they know based on what other, like it, the recommendation engine, this is at the risk of me talking about things that I don't fully know. It's, it is a matrix. And so like you are like a gap in the matrix and they're trying to based on the things that they do know about you, the things that they know about other people. Oh my goodness, my hero. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, it's kind of like, it's kind of like you watch Star Trek and then Netflix is like 99% of the time after somebody watches Star Trek, they're like the third Batman movie. Right, right. Uh -huh. yeah. And, and there's just some kind of connection. Yeah. You know, when you start watching, then you stop watching, like when you lose interest. And they do a lot of split testing, so like A-B tests, they like will implement different features for different users and then see how that impacts behavior. Um, and they're, yeah, they're just like constantly gathering data and refining their, their models and user behavior to create content that they think their users will like, and then that's what's enabled them to like get very niche. Um, yeah, maybe. So, okay, so let me distill that down. So they have, I mentioned like good data pipelines. The, like, the idea of like chaos testing, I think maybe it didn't originate at Netflix, but they really deployed it at scale. So like they have this thing called the chaos monkey that will, it's like a program that like goes in, breaks connections between apps. And they are trying to make their whole data infrastructure like sufficiently fault tolerant that it can defeat this like program that they implement. Um, and they tell their their like new engineers, like if you can break something in prod, like good for you, because like that shouldn't be able to happen because of the, the fail safes that they have implemented. Um, so anyway, so that's one thing of making good decisions is like having high quality data, like and high like data processing pipelines that are really strong. Um, and then they collect a lot of data, they create like these machine learning models and they deploy them with A-B testing. So they have like a cycle of gathering data, the data about data. When you analyze data, it creates more data. Go, ahead, go back to the XKCD. Um, okay, we have like three minutes left of the official time. Um, I have two more areas to cover. I can kind of go through this one really quickly because it's pretty simple. Um, okay, so yeah. Okay, so master data refers to, it's really the data that's shared across the organization. Kind of makes sense given the terminology. Like master data, you should only have one system of record for data that's really important. So like your core list of your business customers. Like you don't want different, different business units to have different perspectives on who your organization serves. So, um, so like having a single list of customers, single list of products, vendors, locations, like the sites of your, your business. Um, yeah, the whole goal is to reduce variation in how these the key entities are defined and identified. Um, you would think this isn't a big deal, but like it is a huge deal. One example is the Mars orbiter uh, crash in 1989. So that was uh, caused because um, Lockheed Martin was using the English standard metrics and NASA was expecting metric standard metrics. And so they, so Lockheed crew is providing measurements of force, um, not in Newtons, and NASA was expecting them in Newtons. And because they had not standardized their master data about which system of measure they should be using to design the orbiter, this like multi, multi, multi million dollar project um, burned up in the side of, it like drifted off course and it burned up on the like grazing 
Mars's atmosphere instead of like orbiting Mars as it was expected to do for like many years. Um, so yeah, this is like, it's easy to explain, but it's like actually can be hard to get right. Um, this is why conceptual data modeling is really important because it really gets at like, what are, what are these core entities? Let's not, let's argue about them now and not after we've designed and implemented our databases. Um, reference data is a subset of master data. And this is, it's just data that's external to the organization that helps the organization understand what it does. So um, as an example of this, like, um, a lot of times organizations will buy data from um, like credit companies like TransUnion to learn more about their customers. Um, and you can also get reference data from like the government, federal government, state government. So a lot of times it's freely available and it can just help. Like, I mean, if you like were sourcing, I don't know, um, information about your neighborhood and using that to inform like where you put your next sandwich shop, um, then the like the geographic information will be an example of reference data. Okay, um, this is super simple. We're just gonna skip these. Um, all right, so yeah, so have the conversations about master data, acquire the reference data as needed. Um, that's kind of this box. All right, and then to wrap us up, data warehousing and business intelligence. So the data warehouse is a specific infrastructure element that provides data consumers, which typically includes analysts, um, business leaders, data scientists, with access to data that has already been cleaned. So ideally they can just get started quickly with their analysis. That cleaning, um, it's like referred to as um, being like shaped to conform to business rules. And then it, the data is stored in a easy to query format. So again, it's like designed to be able to use it for quick, for analytics quickly. Um, the data warehouse typically connects multiple source of truth transactional databases. And um, uh, some examples of you know, changes that are implemented in the data warehouse, the way that it's stored differently than in the operational data systems, um, that includes partitioning, indexing, and decreasing the complexity of table joints. Um, so when you decrease the complexity of the joints, that's what I was referring to in the modeling part, part when I was talking about um, dimensional modeling and how you might have redundant data. So that redundancy, like it, it improves simplicity, decreases complexity of how the table, how normalized tables were linked together. So, okay. Um, I really like this quote. Um, and it kind of speaks to like the data quality issues too. So obviously if your payment processing system goes down, that's gonna be the first thing a company fixes. Um, if a problem interrupts the flow of money, then it won't get addressed. But if you have problems that are not obvious, like a data quality problem that doesn't obviously, it doesn't, completely stop the flow of money, then it might persist for a long time and just kind of harm the overall integrity of the business. And so anyway, I think this, this is a pessimistic take, but I think it's, um, it should motivate, uh, it, it provides a rationale for a really robust data reporting systems because then you can catch more errors. You can learn more about your business. Um, not just the obvious errors that are like, you know, yeah, payment processing went down, but like what else went wrong today that might lead to a data breach or cause us to lose a major customer in the future? Um, or 
would not identify an opportunity that we would have gone after had we had better data reporting. All right, um, so the major objective of setting up a data warehouse is to um, design with the end in mind and uh, aggregate and optimize your data kind of at the end of this process, um, making sure that you're really promoting like democratized access to data. So what I mean by that is like, again, back to the term data literacy, making sure that the business users know how to get what they need. So they're not always like tapping the engineer on the shoulder and being like, hey, like, I don't know this like SQL thing, like help me, you know, maybe the data engineer can save themselves a lot of time if they give the business user, user a better end point so that they can get the data they need. So maybe that's like building them a Tableau dashboard um, or another using another business intelligence tool. Again, like promoting self-service access to data. Metadata, again, is important for that. So making sure the data is labeled so people know how to find what they need. Okay, uh, business intelligence. So this is like making reports and dashboards. Um, again, designing the end in mind, prioritize the objectives and start small and seek feedback. So I think these slides are basically saying the same thing in different words, um, but basically like try to learn from the end user and really empower them to find what they need on their own. Okay, so the, this element of data strategy, it sits towards the top of the data pyramid. So that means it shouldn't be attempted really before you have like this other stuff like solidly locked down. Um, and then this is really essential to having good advanced analytics, data science, statistics, machine learning, AI. All right, cool. So now we're like basically at the end. Um, I will just wrap it up really fast um, after questions, if there are any. Yes. Uh, is, there, is there a good software SAS about kind of automate the pyramid of best practices? Wow, there should be. Maybe my next project will be that. Um, it's hard to automate because, like I said, every business is so specific, but could be great to have a tool. Um, I'm actually working, so as I mentioned, like we are in the entrepreneurship room. Um, and I'm wearing this t-shirt because this is my small business. And one of the products I'd like to come out with this year is a data strategy workbook. So it's like the low tech version of what you were just describing, but it's really like courses, people to fill in the blanks of like, okay, what is the mission statement? How does my data, how do my data challenges relate back to what we're trying to accomplish here at the end of the day? Things like that, but like more exercises, templates, like the five whys. Um, so people can just print that out, copy pages as needed, like take them, go to the meetings, and just have that to start with. Um, so maybe I'll do that this year. I would, yeah, do it a lot faster if I didn't need to see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what other questions do you guys have? So uh, let's just wrap it up with like a quick overview because I think this is both like, it's both very simple and it's a lot. Um, so I keep mentioning this book, The Data Management Body of Knowledge. Um, I'll just show you here. This is what that looks like. It's blue because blue is calming. The book is 600 pages. Um, and if you kind of like read or skim the 600 pages, then you would be qualified to take the, um, the certification, the data management, or excuse me, the certified data management professional. Um, and it is, uh, here we go. So this stat looks really bad. Uh, only 94 jobs. Like this is from a couple of years ago. I need to redo this actually. 
Um, only 94 jobs mentioned this certification, the Certified Data Management Professional certification, but those jobs were associated with leadership, architecture, and management roles. So it's kind of like a quality over quantity situation, I think, where like this is a small group, but it's growing thanks to data strategy professionals. Um, but uh, we, we help facilitate people like taking the certification, learning this content. Um, and then they join like this small, but really like high quality group of data practitioners. Um, this is, we have a Facebook group too. Um, we've added like a thousand members since I took the screenshot. So now we're up to 1200-ish. Um, we have, so this is our, I like emojis a lot. Um, as a, uh, we talked today about like, six of these really. I love to data architecture and data modeling together, um, but each month we cover one to two topics. So you get through the entire like data management body of knowledge in a year. Um, and then there's also like an email study plan if a year is too slow. Um, more info about the exam. This is kind of interesting. So if you think about like how you want to grow your career in the future, um, there is, I think, a lot of like pressure to keep doing what you're doing, and get really good. But actually, I would encourage you to think about diversifying your the breadth of your knowledge. Um, Scott Adams, who is, he likes to think about things. He's, uh, the creator of the Dilbert comics, um, which are like pretty zany, uh, kind of like takes on the business world. Um, anyway, he says, success-wise, you're better off being good at two complementary skills than being excellent at one. So I think that's probably true. I think we can all take this inspiration and kind of Diversify our knowledge. Um, I think that learning data strategy is really good for that if you already work with data. Um, yeah, because it just like you'll know the entire the entire wavelength spectrum instead of just being in your little confined zone. Um, and I just want to wrap this up since we said we'd come back to this. Um, does anybody have a different perspective now on which area of data management they think is the most important of the ones we covered? Or do you want to share any overall thoughts or surprises from this presentation? I see we're just deep in thought, really meditating <laughs> on the meaning of, of this stuff. I mean, it seems like <clears throat> each of them is important in its own way. Yeah. It's like you can't really just say, oh, this is better than this one. Oh, they're equally important, but it serves different purposes. Okay. That's fair. Cool. cool. Okay. Well, we're in agreement then. This slide is a lie. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So that's really it. Um, here's the link to the website with like more of the data strategy content on it. Um, if you found this presentation helpful, don't forget about the page with the space repetition questions. I do think that's really key for locking the knowledge in um, and making this not just like a one time, oh, I heard about this at Tulsa Tech Night, but actually something that you'll remember um, when it's useful when you're in the setting uh, that you know a data strategy related question comes up at your workplace. Okay, that's it. Thank you guys so much. Thanks for your wow. Stay, stay late. <laughs>